Hello, I'm Beth Pocock. I am the Assistant Director at Sawyer Free Library, and we want to welcome all of you to our panel discussion on finding practical solutions to food waste. This is brought to you by a collaboration between Sawyer Free Library and Backyard Growers. Um, we are going to be recording this, so if you have, if you know of anyone who wanted to see it but couldn't be here tonight, we know of some people like that. The recording will be available. It'll be available on our YouTube channel. I'm not sure where it'll be available on Backyard Growers, um, but we'll let you know where you can find it. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're very glad you could be with, here with us tonight. And now I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Laura LaPianca, who is the Executive Director of Backyard Growers. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. So our objective today is to provide you with some broad knowledge as well as some local perspectives on the issues of food waste, along with some actionable steps you can take to help make a difference in food waste reduction. Um, we're going to try an experiment and do a poll to gauge everyone's knowledge of food waste issues and your experience with mitigating um, food waste. So Corinne, if you want to, or Courtney, if you want to load up this poll and see, see if it works. Can you see that? Can you see the poll? Yeah. Okay. I don't see the poll. Am I supposed to see the poll? <laughs> Do people not see it? Can Does anyone see the poll? Yeah, I can I see can the poll. I see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just the two of us. No, just us. <laughs> um, are people responding to it? It seems to be fixed on the first page, so I, it doesn't work when I press next. It doesn't. It's just the three questions that all showed up on the first page for me. Oh, okay. Mine worked. I, I submitted it. You did. I just pulled poll. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was able to submit it too. Great. Um, and then I can't see it. So the poll results, how do we access those, Corinne? There they are. Do you see that? <laughs> okay. Love it. I don't know what they are. You tell me what they are. Beth, you tell us what the poll says. Beth, tell us what the poll says. Okay. How much food is wasted in Massachusetts? 75% of the people got it right. 35% is wasted. 25% uh, of people thought 50% was wasted. Nobody thought 20% was wasted. Do you compost at home? 38% said yes in my backyard. 38% yet yes with a composting service. And 25% said not yet. So we'll be speaking to that group. Do you support any of the following organizations? 100% said they support a food rescue organization. Now, let me see. 25% said they support a gleaning operation. 38% said they support a compost operation. So we've got a pretty dedicated group here tonight. Fabulous. 0% doesn't support anything. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Um, each panelist is going to present for about eight to 10 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for a conversation. Uh, we have Brittany Peets, who is the program manager at the Massachusetts Food System Collaborative. Gary Sp Sprague is the food acquisition and distribution manager at the Open Door. And Andrew Brousseau is the compost manager and partner at Black Earth Compost. And Brittany, I'd love to start with you. And if you could please lead us out by giving us the scope of the food waste problem. Wonderful, thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here and glad to see that so, so many people are so invested already in reducing food waste. Um, so my name is Brittany Peets and I work at the Massachusetts Food System Collaborative and we are a small nonprofit that works statewide to advance uh, food policy issues. Um, we were formed after the creation of the local Massachusetts Food Action Plan, um, which has a lot of different recommendations, and one of them is uh, reducing food waste. So, um, so to go back to kind of defining what is food waste. So food waste happens at a lot of different stages along um, the food system. So 
in the fields, farmers will often plant more than they will necessarily um, need. Um, it's kind of their insurance policy against bad weather or you know, anything that will, will disturb the, the crops that come out at, at the end of the season. Um, and so sometimes there's just too much of a certain crop. So whether a couple of years ago, there were a lot of, there was kind of a glut of apples. Um, so then it, you know, it doesn't um, make, make uh, economic sense for farmers necessarily to harvest, store and transport some of that excess uh, uh, produce. Um, so then it will just kind of rot in the fields or, or go to waste. Um, another thing um, is in grocery stores, um, sometimes they will accidentally order 10 times as many things as they meant to order just because you know they typed it in wrong or uh, the produce might be blemished or the cans or the uh, containers might be dented. Um, so they're, it's perfectly good food, but they just are not gonna put it on their shelves. It might be nearing their expiration date. Um, in cafeterias, in restaurants, um, there's uh, food waste that happens both in the back of the house, you know, people who are preparing the meals. Um, so, or again, ordering too much or producing too much of a certain thing that never gets eaten. Um, and then there's also front of the house waste. So that's when, you know, you order something and it's just too much food for you. Um, and then it ends up uh, becoming plate waste. So that's what it's called when you have too much on your plate that you don't eat. Um, and then that gets disposed of. Um, and then, you know, individual consumers. So in your own home, um, you know, this happens to everyone. You buy too much of a certain thing, you don't get around to, to cooking it or eating it. Um, and that goes um, in the compost or in the trash. Um, so all together, when you add up all those different ways that food waste is created, it ends up uh, globally to be about one third of the food, uh, of the food supply that's, that's wasted. So about 1.3 billion tons a year. Um, so that's a lot. Um, and in uh, the US, if we took all of our wasted food and we grew it all in one place, um, it would cover three quarters of the state of California, just for a visual. Um, and so you can kind of envision the amount of inputs that are, that are being wasted, whether it's water, labor, transportation, processing, all of that is, is just being wasted by, by us um, throwing this out. Um, so in Massachusetts specifically, um, over a million tons of food waste um, goes in the trash annually, um, and that represents about a quarter of the waste stream. Um, at the same time, over 600,000 Massachusetts residents and probably more uh, during the pandemic are food insecure. Um, so making that kind of that disposal of edible food waste um, a missed opportunity to, to work together. Um, and food waste also poses an environmental ha hazard. Um, discarded organic material landfills creates methane, um, a greenhouse gas, and then landfilling or incinerating food waste is expensive. Um, it's heavy, it's wet, it's dense, um, and so it's, it's, very, um, it's very expensive for municipalities um, to dispose of it, and then it also has you know, public health and environmental impacts. Um, so the collaborative, when we're, when we're talking about food waste, we do a couple different things. We've done some research and uh, written a report, um, which perhaps we can put in the, the chat. We're like a well-oiled machine here. Um, we also have a network of food rescue and uh, composting organizations, and we advocate for bills and regulations. And um, the way that we think about um, how we prioritize our work is um, this hierarchy. And we didn't invent this. Um, the, e the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency has used this for a while. They call it the food recovery hierarchy. And we kind of adapted it in, based on some of the research that we had done and thinking about what it looks like on the Massachusetts level. Um, so if we're talking about how to reduce food waste, the first thing would be to reduce food waste at the source, right? So just don't create it in the first place. Don't or over order, um, don't, you know, buy two gallons of milk when you're only gonna go through one gallon, right? The next is feed people in need. And I think Gary will talk a little bit more about this, but the idea is if there's food that's edible and you know we, we're emphasizing edible, nutritious, safe, um, that it should go to people. Um, some of the logistics are obviously um, challenging, um, but that's, um, that's a great way um, for that to make sure that it's not, not going to trash and going to a really good uh, place. 
Uh, the next is feeding animals. Um, so a lot of people, you know, will give scraps to pigs or chickens or what have you. The next one is creating compost. Um, and I think Andrew will talk about this, um, but compost, especially if it's created locally, is a really great amendment for soil and a great way to kind of close the loop on a lot of the, the local food system. And then the last is create energy. And that uh, means um, supporting anaerobic digestion, which is another way, um, aside from composting, of uh, processing um, food waste in a way that um, creates a, a gas that can be used to make energy. So um, when we talk about reducing food waste at the source, some of the ways that we have kind of thought about that is um, highlighting ways that institutions, um, so hospitals, uh, universities, large businesses can reduce the amount of waste that they create through tracking and evaluating their waste. So often you don't know how much food waste or what type of food waste you make until you start to really measure it. Um, and then once you do, I think it can be very um, kind of worrying. Um, and so there are some technologies that, that cafeterias will use so that they're weighing and they're photographing um, and then they can ultimately change their, their ordering and their, their cooking and production um, practices. So that's, that's kind of an interesting way to make it re very real. And then another way um, is standardizing date labels. So, you know, when you look at your yogurt, it has a certain um, date on it. If you look at cereal, it has another date on it. If you look at honey, it has a different date. And um, there's, there's kind of no agreed upon science-based science uh, reasoning for those, those labels at this point. So what some of the legislation would do at the state or federal level would be to standardize that. So say there's one type of label that really indicates uh, based on science uh, quality. So if you, so you should really think, think twice about eating something after, after that date. And then for the rest of the food, you know, that would be, you know, seafood, eggs, meat, stuff like that. Um, for the rest of the food, um, you know, this, they could, manufacturers could put something on it that would kind of suggest like best before, but you know, it's, it, if it's a couple days after and it's cereal or honey, something like that, that doesn't necessarily expire, um, that, um, th that label would look different. So that's getting into the weeds a little bit, but it, it just kind of speaks to kind of a little bit of the consumer education to reduce that confusion. Um, and so getting down to kind of what can you do? Um, so we do a lot of advocacy, so I'm gonna talk about that. And I know that that can be a little bit overwhelming to people, um, but we have a lot of kind of resources on our website and we try to offer um, outreach um, and kind of webinars to, to get uh, people comfortable with the idea of talking with legislators, whether it's at the municipal level or at the state level, um, to talk about how um, we could make a change at, the, at, at a larger uh, scale. Um, so one of the things would be to ask your legislators to support statewide legislation um, that would encourage grocery stores and farms to donate edible food. And so that would be through tax incentives. Um, it would be through increasing liability protection, um, just kind of making it easier for people to do um, what's right and, and, and what's what we want um, to make sure that food's going to the right place. Um, the next would be to ask your municipality to do outreach and education about the importance of diverting food waste. Um, and I think uh, Corinne put in the um, a link to save the food. So that's one example of a public service campaign between the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Ad Council. Um, and it provides a lot of really great graphics and ways that um, municipalities can kind of um, adapt these materials as they see fit. Um, but it already has the graphics and the, the data um, to be able to start the conversation with consumers about why um, reducing food waste is important. And then another example is uh, food too good to waste and that's created by the EPA. And that's another example of um, kind of materials that are ready to be used. Um, and then municipalities can also provide avenues for residents to divert food. So whether that's uh, providing uh, reduced price compost bins or backyard, com backyard composters, or providing a space for food waste drop off, whether that's at a transfer station, a farmer's market, a community garden, et cetera. Um, and then there's also things that your local schools can do. So there, um, MassDEP uh, funds and administers the green team, uh, which empowers students and teachers to improve the environment through waste reduction. Um, it's a free to register for the program and they have a lot of materials, curriculums, and, and support available uh, for schools that are interested in taking that step. 
Um, and then finally, support your local food rescue organization, gleaning organization, composting business. Um, and looking forward to hearing from, from those folks. Thanks. Great. Brittany, that was amazing. You got right to the last five second mark of my timer. Well, well timed. <laughs> um, Gary, are you ready? Oops, I am. my timer. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, well, thanks for having me here tonight. My name is Gary Sprague, and I'm the Food Acquisition and Distribution Manager here at the Open Door in Gloucester. I'm a former newspaper executive of 25 years that um, found my way into hunger, hunger relief through um, volunteering for a number of hunger relief organizations as kind of a common theme in New Hampshire and Massachusetts over these last 25 years. Um, and imagine my surprise when I moved to Cape Ann to be close to the family and found a job at the open door looking for help in their warehouse, um, where I spent the next couple of years handling every morsel of the more than 2 million pounds of food that came and left our property um, each year during that period. Um, in the fall, I expanded my role to take over the food and acquisition job officially, and I take over, I now handle the procurement of all the food as well as management of all of our many distribution programs. The Open Door is a hunger relief organization that has um, pantries in Gloucester and Ipswich, a number of mobile markets that bring food out into the community, and we serve 10 cities and towns in Essex County. The mission of the Open Door is to alleviate the impact of hunger in our community. We do so by using practical strategies to connect people with good food, advocating for those in need, and engaging others in the work of building food security. Um, the Open Door was formed in 1978, and we serve low-income food insecure population. Um, it's a, our clients represent a diverse cross-section of our community, and one in four um, Mem uh, community members in Gloucester um, ex access our services. Oh, I just switched pages too early. Um, our current programs include our Gloucester Food Pantry and a satellite operation in Ipswich. Um, in addition to the mobile markets I mentioned, a community meal program um, that serves a daily prepared meal, SNAP counseling, uh, nutritional education and counseling with a registered dietitian, and of course, our thrift store across town. The food pantries in both Gloucester and Ipswich provide a three to five day um, a lot assortment of emergency groceries. They're set up as miniature grocery stores where our guests can go in and, and self shop picking what they need. Um, it's a full assortment of dry goods, canned goods, meat, dairy, bread, milk, eggs, um, the whole gamut up to uh, and including uh, pet food and diapers. Um, last year, our pantry served more than 47 100 families with 2.4 million pounds of food, 133,000 diapers for kids, and 16,500 pounds of pet food. The mobile, um, mobile markets from the Open Door reached more than 2,600 people in, their, in, in the places where they live, eat, and learn, in schools, in senior centers, in uh, residential um, public housing neighborhoods. The meal programs uh, have a vast array of, of programs, uh, holiday meals, uh, summer meals for kids. Uh, like I mentioned, the community meal that's served here every day. In 2020, the kitchen prepared 45,000 meals and 39,000 um, summer meals for kids. The second glance, the Open Doors Thrift Store across town um, takes gen gently, don't gently, sorry, takes donations of gently used clothing, shoes, household items, they sell them, they help fund the food pantries and the programs that the Open Door, the open door um, manages. But more importantly, um, we think of it as recycling on steroids, where more than 300 tons of textiles and metals were diverted from landfills um, through, that, through that program. And that seg segues me into how uh, we fit into the food system and food rescue. Well, Food secure folks see emergency food organizations as parallel to other food organizations. Our clients see us as the way that they access food. Um, and the key difference being that our services and products are provided to our guests at no cost um, because we have the opportunity to access um, the products and, and 
that we pass on at minimal or, or no cost. And it's also important to mention that 75 to 80% of the open doors food comes already rescued at a higher level through the Greater Boston Food Bank. Regarding food rescue, food rescue is, you know, what is deemed unsaleable, sometimes ugly food, but it's still packed full of nutritional value. Under normal operating conditions, 25% of our food, nearly 500,000 pounds annually, comes from food rescue. And right now we're continuing to work with um, grocers uh, and growers to, to look at how we can provide even more food rescue in this coming year in a COVID safe way. Um, we form our food rescue relationships with people in lots of different ways. And first of all, there's a steady stream of donations that come into this building from individuals all day, every day. There are a number of organized food drives that are put together by the open door or on the open door's behalf in the community all year long. Um, most recently, this last um, fall over the holidays, when we did a deal with We're All In This Together where, and collected over 18,000 pounds of food in a single drive up food drive event. The largest by far amount of our food rescue comes from our uh, participation in the Enabled program that's facilitated by the Greater Boston Food Bank. Um, and they, they connect us with large, large suppliers like uh, Trader Joe's, Stop, Shaw's Stop and Shop, Cumberland Farms, corporate accounts. And beyond that, we develop more local partners by reaching out Gorton's Fish, local bakeries, growers, uh, local smaller grocers and farms and growers um, all participate and support our operation. But while we get our food rescue a whole bunch of different ways, um, the process is, is well established. Just because food is unsaleable doesn't mean it's waste. Um, and we work with our food rescue partners so that they handle the food um, in a way assuming that it still has value prior to us picking it up. Um, the Open Doors built an in infrastructure that allows us to be on the road five days a week collecting this food, food rescue opportunities, um, as well as pick up any that kind of creep up along the way. The product is brought back to our warehouse where it's, um, where it's weighed by category and recorded into our do uh, donor database. And then we look at it and, and figure out like, what are we gonna do with this stuff? And you know, it, it takes a first pass where we can determine we can distribute some of it immediately right into the pantry. Uh, some of it may go right into our kitchen where they prepare it into a meal that they're making um, for either a community meal or any program that they, you know, they have running on any given day. Um, and then of course, what requires further sorting and editing. And then that goes through another process where we give special attention to uh, prepared foods, dairy um, and the produce um, where we sort it based on how long it's gonna last. And you know, if, it, if, it's, if it's gonna go into the pantry right away, we sort it by category and do so. If it needs to be cleaned up a little bit, we'll put it into another category and do so before we move it into the pantry. Um, and then we also look at it uh, in, in its terms of its longevity. What can we um, hold off that may be good tomorrow for our pantry or program um, or collaborative partner that may be looking for something from us. Our kitchen also rises to any occasion to incorporate food rescue on to any, gay, any given day's meal that they may be preparing. For example, sal, um, mixed greens or salad ingredients uh, can always be substituted as the vegetable component on, in any meal that they're preparing on any given day. Um, things that, you know, bruised melons and, and, and beat up fruit like that can be pared down, um, the good separated from the bad, it, and then the um, good chopped up and packaged into what we call uh, healthy choice, easy choice for distribution in our pantries and uh, markets. Um, and, you know, and that's basically, that's basically organized food rescue. I don't know how much time I have left, but um, I have a couple of fun experiences that I'd like to share about just some crazy food rescue projects that I've encountered here at the open door um, on my yeah, very one minute. <laughs> one minute well okay why don't I tell my favorite then okay. my favorite was the year before last where I took um, a literal ton of pumpkins the day after Halloween and let me tell you nobody wants a pumpkin the day after Halloween we resorted to putting up decorative displays out front trying to encourage our guests to do the same at home um, but I, I very quickly learned that you know it was like selling sand on a beach um, 
where it did work really well was just last week when a truck driver called me with a thousand prepared Santa Fe chicken salads and uh, that were turned away um, from a large grocer. Again, they probably overordered or made an ordering mistake. Um, you know, they can't, they can't, they can't you know, turn them into landfill. So the guy was desperate. He called me, what can you do with these? Um, and we happily took them. We replaced um, the meal of the day with the salads as well as uh, redistributed, them, redistributed them immediately into both pantries and all the markets and senior programs that we served that week. And not a, out of 1,080 salads, not a single one went to waste. So That is a good story. Um, Andrew, we're going to open it up to you now. You have to unmute. Uh, there, there we go. Yeah, my name is Andrew Brusso. I'm with Black Earth Compost. Um, I've been with the, them for 10 years. I am a partner with it, so I am trapped and having a great time doing it. We pick up food waste from all over Massachusetts. Um, from the New Hampshire border all the way. Um, we actually have a route in Falmouth now. It's kind of a remote route, but we do have that there. Um, but we're down in Sharon, um, down south of Boston. I don't even know where we are. Um, you know, be, because of Black Earth, about 80 communities in Massachusetts now have access to curbside collection and that's at your home. And that is one of the easiest ways to manage your food waste. And it's also one of the easiest ways to have an impact on climate change. Um, you know, buying an electric car, buying solar panels, making other changes, um, either cost money or there's other issues that are preventing you, but food waste is very easy. Um, you basically just put it in a different bin and you put it out each week and then it is not going to the landfill or the incinerator. Um, in the incinerator, they burn vegetables to make electricity. They don't do, they don't, vegetables don't burn well. And at the landfill, they, sit in anaerobic conditions and basically all the carbon, a lot of the carbon converts to methane and CO2 and is released from the landfill. So um, black earth compost. So there's, we pick up the food straps from homeowners, schools, restaurants, and we bring it back to our compost sites uh, we have one in Manchester, Mass., another one in Groton, Mass., where we convert it into a finished product. And we sell that back to farms, gardeners, and others who um, grow food, flowers, lawns, perennial. Um, like when I got into this, I was like, oh, we got to, you know, grow food with that food waste because that's the only true recycling. You know, but growing flowers is important uh, for pollinators. Growing, like improving the soil under your lawn or improving the soil around your trees is important because compost has a lot of potential to help plants sequester more CO2 into the soil. And um, compost is a great tool for that. There's some figure for like every ton of compost that you applied to soil you know, over the next certain amount of years, it um, uh, draws down CO2. And it's not so much the, the carbon that's in the actual compost. It, a lot of the drawdown is just because you are giving plant nutrients to the plants and they are able to um, function much more effectively in drawing sugars out of the atmosphere. Um, so, and the reason that works is the plant nutrients. So, um, so something we haven't talked about is when we talk about uh, food waste, like, and recycling it, what are we actually recycling? Um, you know, at, at Black Earth, so at the food pantry, yes, they're taking waste. So that's true recycling. They're taking food and they're turning it into food. 
at Black Earth, we're taking food and we're turning it into We have a frozen Andrew. My wife just called. I cut my <laughs> yeah. You're back. Um, so what are we recycling? We're recycling the plant nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, calcium, sulfur, manganese, molybdenum, all the micronutrients and plant nutrients. That is literally what we're recycling back to farms to grow food. And those nutrients, those came from mines. They're generally mined out of rock. Nitrogen's mined out of atmosphere. Sulfur is mined as a byproduct to petroleum production. So all these nu plant nutrients are mined, used one farm field to grow food, which we then eat and it's street out to the ocean or the wastewater treatment plant. And then we have to go back to the mine to uh, mine more nutrients. So if you take that, if you think of food waste recycling in that context, you know, you can think of like an aluminum can. Like who thinks it's okay to throw an aluminum can in the trash can? Um, most people don't because we've been trained to be like, all right, we need to recycle that to make more aluminum cans. What are we recycling? The aluminum that we mined out of rock, likely out of Australia. Food waste recycling is the same thing. We're recirculating a mined product, the fertilizer, back um, so human society can use it again. Um, that's some big picture stuff, and I can talk more about that in the question section. Um, what you can do at home, so you can backyard compost. Um, let me back up. Uh, the best thing you can do is... Um, what Brittany mentioned about the hierarchy, you know, best thing to do is reduce your food waste um, followed by feeding people, which is back to food rescue organizations. That's the highest and best thing you can do with a food. If you can't do that, the next thing is feed animal or others. Um, that is very underappreciated, but that is so much better than composting um, because you're turning food into animal protein on day one. Okay, composting's next. And so if you can't do the above things at home, you can backyard compost or you can compost with black earth. I don't even backyard compost. Um, I don't have time. You can look at me, I'm doing a Zoom call from my car. This is our busy season and we, this is when we, um, this is harvest season for a composter, you know, harvest for farmers in the fall, but spring is harvest for us. So I don't even have time to backyard compost. So I use black earth and uh, it's very affordable. It's two to $4 a week. We have all kinds of price breaks so that like, um, you know, if Gloucester gets a certain number of people on board, then the price drops you know, down to $2 per person per week. And then more people join on and the price drops even more. So that's been our whole business model. And um, it's really about making it affordable and making it more accessible. And the great thing about the curbside service, we come every week and you can put so many more things in there like uh, meat, fish, dairy, bread, lobsters, compostable, you know, forks, knives, spoons, cups, plates, if it's BPI certified. Um, so we can take a lot more than a backyard pile. We come every week. And if you backyard compost, I can give you tips on it, but just don't feed animals. Like do not put food on top, do not leave it out. If you're feeding animals, then you're doing us all a disservice because it basically just increases rodent populations and then people look down on composting and, and yeah. Um, and lastly, something you can do is you can get your school composting. You can get your um, favorite restaurant to compost. Um, a lot of these places are gonna be wrapped up in a, a band by 
the Department of Environmental Protection. And th they're going to have to um, compost. So like large institutions right now are falling under that ban. So large high schools are being forced to. And as um, and th the reason behind that is there's no new landfills or incinerators being opened in Massachusetts. And we are having to send our trash by train to Ohio. And um, so you can help um, just talk to organizations, tell them it's an interest of you, schools, restaurants, cafeterias, homeowners, your neighbors. Honestly, the, the like, so we have, we're in 80 towns doing curbside collection. Um, some towns have a thousand people doing it. Some have 60. And the difference is that a champion in a town just like takes it, takes all the tools we have and they run with it and they organize people and I've seen it done about 10 or 11 times and the program is just enormous and it makes a big impact. So don't underestimate your potential. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you to all the panelists. We're gonna open it up for a lively conversation. Um, so if anyone has any questions for the panelists, um, either for you know someone in particular or to the whole group, you can put it in the chat. Um, but I am going to lead out um, with a question of my very own. Um, what are some misconceptions we have about food waste reduction strategies? Um, what do people misunderstand about composting or food recovery or other points along the food waste recovery hierarchy? Uh, Brittany, do you want to start on that one? Oh, gosh. Uh, sure. Um, misconceptions. I feel like the biggest one is people not thinking about it at all. Um, so that's a problem. Um, so just, you know, not thinking when you over order, not thinking about it when you, you know, over shop or, you know, dump, dump food in the, in the trash. Um, so that's definitely an issue. Um, and then I think it's really important to think, I know I've, we've, we've mentioned this several times about the hierarchy. So don't, you know, don't jump right to, you know, I'm going to compost. Think about, you know, how to reduce it at the source first. Um, you know, think about how you could donate it to people in need. Um, and then I think another misconception is that like food waste is necessarily like gross or unhealthy, or it's like kind of cast offs that's like has this like kind of negative connotation but a lot of the food I mean Gary can attest it's it's perfectly good food it's just you know there were a lot of gingerbread houses that were left over you know and it's not Christmas anymore so you know it's still perfectly good food it's just you know it's not needed anymore um, at the grocery stores or whatever it is um, so I think just reframing how we think about it as as, you know, excess food or surplus food, it's not, it's not unsafe or, or no longer good to eat. Yeah. Andrew, I, you want, I, oh, Andrew I, go ahead. I agree with that. Like one third of the food that we bring in from commercial stops is very edible and I have eaten it and it's no problem. Gary, you want to jump in? Sure. I mean, I, for, I think, first of all, um, there's no amount of food that you can donate that's too great or too little. Um, you know, there have been a, a single can of something that's walked into this building that I've immediately redistributed, um, you know, without a problem. Uh, earlier, I believe Brittany talked about um, expired dates and, and how they're so loosey-goosey loosey in some spots. Um, there's certainly the milk, the eggs, the, the seafood that you want to adhere to those dates or, you know, it'll, it, it could make you real sick. But anything in a can or a bag, um, you know, we have a mechanism that uh, will redistribute that up to a year after its expired date in some circumstances, um, you know, with, without, you know, with, with very little problem. Um, as far as the, you know, the more organic things, um, like I said, we, we have a, a, a team committed to editing that down and making it good again. Um, so yeah, there's, um, there's no amount too great or too small. Excellent. Um, 
please go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Uh, Beth had asked how many people are, are composting with, with Black Earth in Gloucester. And Andrew says around 200 residential customers and Beverly has 1,100. That's quite a, oh, quite a jump. Um, I can lead out with another question and anyone else can put something in the chat in the meantime. Um, can you all speak to what is standing in the way of reducing food waste? What are the barriers on both a micro and a macro level that's making this a, a continuing problem? Gary, you want to start? Let's mix it up. Yeah, that's a barriers to, to getting food waste. As I, you know, I probably think, you know, tagging back to the thing that I just mentioned about just it, it's awareness and the, and the vast amount of things that you can do with it before you simply decide to throw it in the garbage. Uh, maybe that's education and community building. Um, you know, maybe that's getting, you know, more involved in, you know, it, it, it takes an effort to, to find a place to, to deposit that food. Um, so, you know, maybe a, a greater amount of networking. Um, I have a, I, there's kind of a uh, question that's looking for some response or a, an answer. So do you think a barrier is um, just the, the level that we've gone to like protect people from never ever getting sick ever? like at a restaurant or at a grocery store like ha have we tried to protect people like to the 99.99999% and like it's to our detriment um you know like the law of diminishing returns like to get the first 99% costs a million dollars get the next 0 0.99 it's another million but get the next 0 0.00099 it's like 10 billion like, did we go too far? I, I don't know if you're asking me, but I, my opinion is uh, that it's like the, the pendulum swings, you know, we had people dying over um, unpasteurized milk, you know, back in the day. And so a big effort and it saves a lot of lives. And then, yeah, I think it's just, um, anyone else have an opinion on that? I don't know, Andrew. I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, I know the answer. It's that we went too far. You went um, too far? Yeah. Uh, Melanie has a question for Gary. Uh, sometimes law enforcement will seize illegally caught lobsters and fish. Does the open door receive this so it isn't wasted? Well, you know, that was one of my little factoids that I ran out of time on. Oh, <laughs> You know, one of my one of my favorite things that we took on uh, one time, 36 cases of oysters that were improperly tagged. Uh, the environmental police brought to us and we redistribute them immediately. Um, just uh, the summer before last, there was an occasion where they delivered us um, three or four huge chest coolers full of striped bass as long as my leg. Um, and we gave them out just like that. We cleaned them up, bagged them, um, and gave out the whole fish. So absolutely, yes, it's, it's um, we, we turn nothing away. <laughs> Great. Um, a question I think for Andrew, um, if you could um, clarify your points around the hierarchy of reducing food waste um, when you get to the composting phase um, to yeah. sort of that breakdown. Yeah, so it, it's on the EPA's website. Um, if you look up the hierarchy of food recycling, I think the top one is reduce your the, the food waste, just reduce it. It's just like, what's the best thing to do to reduce your energy use? It's not buy a more efficient TV, it's don't turn the TV on. So at the top is don't waste food. After that, if you do have wasted food, you provide it to a food rescue operation or you, you send it to feed humans. So it's don't waste food, feed humans. If you can't do that, feed animals like pigs, chickens, etc. If you can't do that, then composting. 
And if you can't do that, then yeah, you gotta put it in the landfill or incinerator because we can't let it pile up on the street. Um, Brittany just posted in the chat where you can go to, to see that hierarchy um, laid out the way Andrew just described. Um, so I think, I mean, does, do the panelists have questions for, for one another? I know Brittany, you had some some question, a question you wanted to ask of the food rescue um, and the, the composting crew. Yeah, I think, I think you had asked one of my questions, which was kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, no, which is great. Um, something about the barriers. Um, and I would love to just jump in from my perspective on kind of like a legislative level of some of the barriers um, that we've seen is that, um, Kind of businesses don't necessarily know how much food they're wasting um, and they don't know about their options for reducing it um, so you know getting them to measure measure their food waste um, getting them to get connected to food waste donation um, a lot of times uh, restaurants in particular with prepared foods um, get worried about liability um, so are they going to be held liable if anybody eats the food that they donate and then gets sick? Um, and they are protected um, by the Good Samaritan law. Um, and so I think that doing outreach to businesses about the fact that that exists and they are protected um, is important. Um, is that part of what your organization does, Brittany? So we have been supporting some some legislation that would actually expand some of that liability protection. Yep, um, but that's a federal law um, that's reinforced at the state level as well. Um, but does it is there anybody who is tasked with communicating that to the to restaurants and businesses? That is a very good question, and that tees me up um, for my next point, which is that the Department of Public Health. Um, we feel like could do more around communicating that message to businesses. Um, right now, a lot of it is left to local departments of, uh, of health or um, boards of health. Um, and so schools, businesses, institutions can get kind of conflicting messages at the local level about what's allowed. Um, so I think that yes, clarifying that guidance and there actually is some legislation um, this session that would do just that. It would task DPH with making specific guidance um, that could be applied for businesses, for, for boards of health, et cetera. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. Good. I have a question for Gary. Go for it. What do you think the bottleneck is, or like um, that's preventing more uh, human mouths being fed by rescued food. Is it that there's not enough human mouths uh, standing in line getting ready for food? Is it not enough trucks and distribution? Is it not enough warehouses and like, like land for the distribution or is it trucks and paying people for those trucks to distribute or is it people donating the food? Well, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's kind of all and none of the above at the same time. Um, you know, there's a certain negative connotation that goes around with, with um, you know, needing accessing food. There's a, there's a stigma attached to it. Uh, where food rescue plays a, a great part in that is um, we can, through food rescue, provide our guests in, in addition to, you know, you know, just service with dignity and, you know, a, a full access pantry with, with self-shopping in place. Um, food Rescue gives us the opportunity to divide a, a product line that there's less stigma attached to in the Del Monte can of green beans, as opposed to the, to the ones that obviously came from, um, you know, an institution like the Greater Boston Food Bank um, is, is, is a huge factor. Um, and then, you know, more partnerships to be able to acquire that type of product is I think, um, is I think paramount in what we need to try to do. Uh, we have some uh, something in the chat about gleaning, um, and a, a mention of a documentary um, about communities of food gleaners. Um, that looks really interesting. And then Brittany posted 
one of the local organizations that does um, a lot of gleaning project uh, projects, Boston Area Gleaners. Um, so that's worth checking out. Um, they do a lot of food rescue. Yeah, we've tapped the um, the Boston area gleaners on a on a number of occasions um, for especially especially for fast produce during the summer months. They were they were our number one supplier of corn on the cob um, all last season. It seems like a lot of like to Andrew's point. There's so much that has to do with capacity. Um, you know, there's an organization devoted to gleaning because that's a whole thing that has to happen and be coordinated. Um, so for me, that that's one of the barriers that I see in um, how food waste is is handled is the you know just the capacity of all of these groups and the connections and the communicating between everyone um, seems like a hurdle. And when it comes to farms, just to jump on a little bit, um, you know, a, a lot of the reason that farms wouldn't participate. Um, or wouldn't do this on their own is because of the cost. Right. Um, and so one of the bills um, that we're supporting as well um, would make sure that, that farmers are getting uh, credits towards our taxes um, to help them kind of offset the cost of, of harvesting, storing and, and transporting uh, food that they wouldn't be able to sell in the marketplace. Um, Brittany, what is the best way for people who are kind of new to doing advocacy type actions for them to hook into what you are supporting and so that they can sort of do quick, immediate action without having to unpack the whole thing themselves? Yeah, great question. Um, so there are a various different ways you can get involved with a collaborative. Um, so as I said, I have kind of like a network of food rescue organizations. So you're welcome to kind of uh, get involved with that if that's um, kind of, that would be useful for, for you. Um, we also have a newsletter. So we, we do updates on kind of what legislation is happening and how to get involved. We've been doing um, some webinars and we have uh, a series ongoing right now on Thursday afternoon around specific bills and how you can um, kind of advocate and, and help craft the message around, around each of those specific bills. And one of those, I think it's on May 24th, is around uh, one of the food waste bills. Um, so we'd love to have you on that webinar to talk about it. Um, yeah, and then I, I think uh, finding, finding local organizations that are doing the work, um, like Gary and Andrew, is, is a great way to get involved. Definitely. It looks like the name of this documentary is called The Gleaners, which is perfect name. <laughs> um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, we're, we're almost to the end of our hour. I, I was going to, to close with sort of a, a fantasy future question. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we're touching upon all these different uh, points in the, the food waste chain sort of in your perfect future world, um, how would this system function differently? What would need to happen so that um, we weren't in this place of creating epic um, food waste? What are the parts? What's the, what are the things that need to synergistically be working together to make this happen? It can be like outer space. You can make it your perfect world. <clears throat> um, I think it needs to be made a priority um, because like we've built our entire society around um, like a way of not thinking about waste management and just not dedicating space, time or resources to it. And, you know, to retool that it's hard because there might not be land or there might not be resources or there's we've gone down a different path too far and it's hard to unwind, whether it's legislature, habits, whatever it is, it's hard to unwind to go back. Um, mm -hmm. So I think big picture is like making space. Yeah, and new habits. Yeah. Gary, you wanna? Well, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't really have anything to add to that. I agree with both of those things. I think, you know, um, getting people to, to handle food differently at home or at work and in restaurants can be a little bit like turning around an aircraft carrier after, after just having the opportunity to discard it for so long. 
Brittany, paint us a picture of the future. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, no pressure. No pressure. Oh. <laughs> so one of the things that um, we talk about a lot in our work is making the food system more, um, more local, more regional. And so I think when, when you start to think about kind of what are the resources in your area and how can you kind of keep the resources in your area, then you automatically start thinking about, you know, we have to make sure that, you know, the farms near us are providing the food that we can, we can use um, and that we're being responsible with what our neighbors are producing. Um, and then, you know, that, you know, the excess food that we have is, is again, going to feed our neighbors or going to create soil so that we can, you know, grow more food locally. So I think it really is about kind of shrinking the supply chain um, mm -hmm. in a way that's kind of more intentional and more responsible and more sustainable. I'm just thinking of my own little urban farm and on this teeny little downtown property in Gloucester, and there's no place to put anything like everything needs to be considered and repurposed and composted and you know this dry material is now going to be used as mulch and then eventually it's going to go in, back in the compost and it's like we're just constantly rotating these inputs and it feels really good it feels like mm, this is what we should be doing and so it's like it's almost like a philosophical place where if we could get people in that mindset around there's no mysterious place where things go and disappear, it's still somewhere, um, which of course is an issue with trash in general. Um, but again, I think it goes back to that like educational piece and changing of habits and the aircraft um, carrier. The aircraft carrier. Yeah. Um, I like Brittany's uh, point about the farms. I think. If you make space for the farms in Massachusetts, then the rest might fall in line. Um, but like they're kind of under siege from high land value. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't think we'll ever have enough farms to feed everyone in Massachusetts, but we could get a long way. And one thing I was thinking about earlier is I wish everyone would have greens growing in, the, in their backyard. <clears throat> because greens are easy and it's one of the more carbon intensive items at the grocery store because of like refrigeration and short um, and like quick transportation needed. So if everyone grew greens in their backyard, um, I think it'd make everyone healthier. And uh, yeah, so that's my rosy vision of the future. Well, and that's where Backyard Growers comes in because we are, um teaching people how to grow their own food in backyards and community gardens and school gardens. And I actually have a whole um, diatribe about growing salad greens in the spring and interplanting so that there's salad greens happening at every moment. Um, so we'll do our part over here with that, with your future vision. Anyone have any closing comments? I, this, is gonna, this has been recorded and available to be seen um at a later time but does anyone have any closing thoughts before we head out i feel very inspired by you all so thank you for that oh and thank you i do truly and today i went to second glance and i bought my first bag of black earth compost so i feel really good and then <laughs> i end the day with with this wonderful zoom so thank you <laughs> great You're welcome. well thank you to our panelists um and um, we hope to keep in touch with everybody. Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks so Thank much, you. everyone. Thank <laughs> Thanks. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Anything else?